talk to you out of Hebrews chapter 10, 23 and 25, and I'm still there. Let me read that in your hearing and then the text for today. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now this morning, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning with the first verse. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians and God and our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ grace and peace be to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to always thank God for you brothers and sisters and rightly so because your faith is growing more and more. It's doing what? Growing, growing more and more and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith and all the persecutions and trials you're enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give you relief, give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This was happened when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. Talk about this. This is part two. This is the Lord's church. This is the Lord's church. Please. Be seated. Wow, what a beautiful morning we are having and this beautiful singing, this adorning the Lord in that beautiful song that J.J. and the choir just led us in with Glenn Winfrey. I want to start this message out. I know you musicians are leaving, but I want you all to hear this. And I don't even know if Carolyn knows this song. She may know it. We're not going to sing it. But I want to begin this message by quoting it. It is an old hymn that I used to sing, we used to sing when I was in college. It is entitled, please listen to it, Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray and holy manna will be showered all around. Brethren, see poor sinners round you slumbering on the brink of woe. Death is coming. Hell is moving. Can you bear to let them go? See our fathers and our mothers and our children sinking down. Brethren, pray in holy manner. We'll be showered all around. Sisters, will you join and help us? Moses' sister aided him. Will you help the trembling mourners who are struggling hard with sin? Tell them all about the Savior. Tell them that he will be found. Sisters, pray, and holy manner will be showered all around. Is there here a trembling jailer seeking grace and filled with tears? Is there here a weeping Mary pouring forth a flood of tears? Brethren, join your crowd of cries to help them. Sisters, let your prayers abound. Pray, oh pray, that holy manna may be scattered all around. 
Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners till our God makes all things new. Then he'll call us home to heaven. At his table we'll sit down. Christ will gird himself and serve us with sweet manna all around. That's a great song. I said, that's a great song. I know you don't know it's a great song. You just need to hear it. And when all the saints are in harmony together, whoa, what a powerful witness to the ever fast flowing and ever fervent presence of the Holy One. I need to say this to you this morning. We're in the army. I know. I need to tell you all this because you don't know it. You are in the army of the Lord. You have been conscripted, and some of you have volunteered, and the Holy Ghost sought you and brought you, and some of you honored him by saying yes to his will. George Buona, a contrarian, says that this emerging generation has no understanding of, no understanding of the Bible or even many of the stories of the Bible because their parents failed to teach them about the Lord and his word. Their parents failed to take their kids to church and to role model for their kids the value of the church. You know we're living in a different world. I don't have to tell you that. You know it's different. You know that people are not the way they used to be. Now, I'm not saying that everybody was the same back in the past couple of generations, but you know that was a time when people would not fail to make the meeting on Sunday, not just to show off their stuff, but to show off their God and to show and bask in the faith of their fathers and to herald the fact that this is the Sunday, yeah, the day that Jesus arose from the dead on the third day. And this is the day that we are to show the world that indeed the light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Wow, children need the church. Parents need the church. Families need the church. Look at it. There was a time when we were young, I need not talk about that man who talking about the past is a dying man, but I just want to use it as a moment of reflection. There was a time when we could go to bed without having to lock our doors. Look at this thing this week with Ray Rice. We're talking about Ray Rice. What about these young men cold cocking people around the community, knocking people out, and all of these other crazy and bizarre things, this gang pillaging and the, the wars between the gangs and children are afraid to go to school because of all of the bullying and all of the negative things that are happening in our communities. You know why? Because people won't go to church and they won't bring their children to church to be taught that there is a better ethic When we gave our hearts to the Lord Jesus, we were not tricked. No, we were not snookered. We were not suckered. It was a smooth transaction. Let me read how smooth it was. It's Romans chapter 10, beginning with the eighth verse. Our faith was born because of by hearing the message of salvation. But what saith is this King James? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. And it is the word of faith which we preach. 
that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believeth on him shall be, shall not be ashamed. When I was a youngster, the church was a haven. It was the place, the city of refuge. I never will forget it was a prayer meeting night. I can't tell you what night that was. I think it was a Wednesday night. I was a youngster, teenager at Golden Leaf Missionary Baptist Church, and the people were on their knees praying, and all of a sudden, here comes old Charles Ford running through the door. Reverend Hamlin, Reverend Hamlin, Reverend Hamlin. They, Joe Duck, they out there trying to jump on me. Yeah, I know it sounds crazy. You probably did. Yeah. See, that's what the church, the church is a refuge. A place where you used to go to where men were men. And they stood for something and they had courage, and the children knew where they could find the men to protect them. Yeah, it's hard to find that today. You don't know who's who. You don't know who's under the cover, over the cover, uncovered. You don't know what's going on today. Man, man. Here it is again, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 14. I read it to you, please, this morning out of the Message Bible. I read some of it. We heard the message and faith was born. Did you hear? We heard the gospel preach and we got, we believed that our faith was born because of the sacrifice of Messiah. His blood poured out on the altar of the cross where we, we are a free people, free of penalties and punishment, chalked up by all our misdeeds and not just barely free either, abundantly free. He thought of everything. This is Jesus thought of everything provided for everything we could possibly need letting us in on the plan he took provided everything such delight in making he set it all before us in Christ a long range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in him everything in deepest heaven everything on planet earth it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for listen People want to know where you, what are you supposed to be living? What's your purpose? What's your aim? What's your goal? It's in Christ. But if you can, you've got to be in position to hear it. In Christ, we find out who we are and what we're living for long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up. He had his eye on us, had designs on us for glorious living. What kind of living? Glorious. What kind of living? Glorious. Wondrous living, wondrous living. You can't imagine what God wants for you. And if you have the heart of God, you quit complaining about what he's doing for others. No place for rancor, no place for jealousy. Part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross. We are a free people, free of penalties and punishments chucked up by our misdeeds. Did I read that to you all before? 
And not just barely free, I even abundantly free. He thought of everything, provided for everything we could possibly need, letting us in on, uh, on the plans he took such delight in making. He set it all before us in Christ, a long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up him, everything in deepest heaven, everything on planet Earth. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up. He had his eyes on us. My head read it. He had his eyes on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose, he is working out in everything and everyone. It's in Christ that you once, you heard the truth and believed this message of salvation. Found yourselves home free, signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit. This signet from God is the first installment on what is coming, what's coming. A reminder that we'll get everything God planned for us, a praising and glorious life. You can't imagine what your future is like. Time here is so minuscule. It's just like, to, life is just like this. It's like, And then before long, you've been another realm looking back. Once you've committed your life to the Lord, I'm telling you that you got signed up. I'm telling you, you got fitted. And after you got fitted, God gave you this document. I'm talking about this book, this covenant. And he gave you the equipment to live by and have with you until you get home. Now, oh. Elderly people understood that. They used to sing this song that kind of hinted on that. They said, we are soldiers in the army. We got to fight. Although we got to cry, we got to hold to the bloodstained banner. We got to hold it up until we die. Uh, you know, to be a soldier, you had to sign up. You had to go through basic training. I mean, you got to learn the manual. You got to be committed. You got to get up when you're told to get up. You got to uh, get in training and walk when they tell you to start walking. Stop. You got to learn how to break down your weapon, learn how to put it back up again. But you can't get no, no, no you can't be a soldier in the army of the Lord if you don't have your, if you don't know this. You're neutralized. You don't have anything to offer. You can't stand the storms. You can't stand the tremors. Instead of being a spiritual giant, you become a wavering weakling. You become a wimp. All people got to do is just. Tossed to and fro by every wind and doctrine. Talk about last week. It was amazing to me, man. People on television. Look at that. There's nothing wrong with the TV. There's nothing wrong with spiritual programs on television. But if you end this, you know the Bible says that you are to. Try the spirit to see whether. I'm moved by this one. I'm moved by that one. I'm stirred by this. I think I ought to go here. I think I ought to go here. I ought to join this church. I got this. This is the new one now. I got this revelation. You got a new revelation? The revelation is right here. tell you something, several things. 
that we're going to come close to the brink of death. And if God and his sovereign will permits us to recover, we will look at life from a different perspective. We will begin to see not only how life ought to be lived, but we're also going to behold the first time those things which were really essential in life. Sometimes you don't know what's important until you're at death's door. Life changes. I never forget I, when I had that heart attack in 1990, and once I slowed down, once I slowed down, I learned one of the things the doctor said: pace yourself. You, you don't start pacing, man, until you, until you get close. You pace. You hear me? Pace yourself. Did y'all hear what I said? Pace. P a c. Pace yourself. Well, why? Why do we need church? I'll tell you why you need church. A, we need the church because the church teaches us we can't live without God. They teach us we can't live without God. We can't live without God. I know you're big. I know you're bad. I know you're tough. <laughs> but you can't live without God. I want to tell you something. God really doesn't need you. He allows you the opportunity to witness his glory and what he's doing in the world, what he's doing among people. God doesn't need you. He doesn't need your help. And people say, God needs No, you crazy, man. What were you doing? What was God doing before you ever got here? Not only that be, the church teaches us that we cannot live without forgiveness. That's amazing to me. It's amazing to me. I, people are so quick. When something happens in the lives of people, I've looked at this and I've seen it on TV and I've seen it in every other kind of say, I'm amazed at people how when somebody gets in some trouble they're willing to kill them just crucify them just destroy them yeah they're strong yeah, 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 man, yeah. He, they do he, yeah do this get rid of them da, 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 da. until something happens and I get caught doing it Come on now, I know I'm talking. I know you're looking at me getting that. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna say it again. People are willing to crucify others until they get caught. Or their children get caught. And then see, church teaches us that you can't live without prayer. You can't live without praying. You've got to learn how to pray. Yeah. You gotta learn how to pray. You, you, gotta, you gotta learn how to pray. You gotta learn how to have a relationship with God and with your fellow man, but you got to learn how to get before the face of God and how to seek him with all of your might. Call on the Lord until you get an answer. And then this is what else the church teaches us, D. The church teaches us that you cannot live without friends. You can't live without friends. You got to have friends. Now, I, I know some of you are, what do you call it, uh, loners, uh, introverts, or whatever. But you can't live without friends. You need somebody. Everybody. If, I said everybody needs somebody. You need, you need somebody. You wouldn't be in the mess you were in if you'd had somebody you could talk to or would allow somebody to talk to you. You need somebody. That's the way they said. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Here it is. We can't live without the church, point number one. Now, 
Listen to me. Let us not neglect coming together. I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, we've got to come together and understand that the world is changing. The problem is today the Bible says that two are stronger than one and a three-fold cord, cord is not easily broken. And the Bible says if one can put a thousand to flight, then two can put ten thousand. You need allies in the faith. You need allies in the faith. Now let me tell you why. And I want to tell you why. Because you and I are in a battle. I mean, it's an unseen battle. The conflict is between heaven and earth. It's between light and darkness. The conflict is between good and evil. It's between God and the devil. It's between the spiritual. And, and, and you're in the center of the conflict. It's a fight for our minds. It's a fight for our souls. It's a fight for our conscience. It's a fight for our family. It's a fight for our country. It's a fight for the church. It's fighting all in the perimeters of faith. And I want to tell you, you can't fight all by yourself. You can't fight all by yourself. No, no, no. No, 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 no. But I tell you one thing, Kevin, this is God knows truth. I learned, I learned it from Liverpool. If you're going to fight, there's some folk you don't want to fight with you. You, you don't even want them close to you. When, when it's time to fight, you don't want them around. Remember that song, God don't want, he don't need no coward soldiers in his band. You remember that? No, that's Shirley C's old song, Caravan. Wait a minute, you, you, you too young. You, you <laughs> well, these first century Christians, this was what they were doing. They were living in this era, and what was happening was they're doing like we're doing now. They were absenting themselves from the assembly, from the body. And whenever you are absent from the body, it's like a chain, a, a leak missing from the chain. Well, that's alarming for us today. Let me tell you why. Church, church attendance has fallen on hard times. Church people are in going, people are in decline. The latest Gallup poll survey made a sobering discovery. 20, just 26% of young adults and 32% of middle-aged people go to church every week. Excuses for not attending church are as plentiful as you can imagine, Gallup says. The fact is that many professing believers think they can be good Christians without being a part of the local body. But this was what they were doing here. And they were missing it. And what was happening was they were missing the fact that you need harmony and you need fellowship when you're forging the army of the Lord. Secondly, second, and another thing, the reason why you need harmony is because when Christ put us in the church, he did not want us to remain at the same level. When you come in, you come in as a little babe. Sad to say, there are still so many babies in the church. You got five years in, 10 years in, 15 years in, 20 years, and still drinking milk. I won't say something else, but it won't come out right. <laughs> hey, welcome in. Why the church? Secondly, 1 Timothy 3 and 5 says that the church is the pillar of truth. It is the pillar of truth. Jesus said, I want you to know the truth. You can't find the truth everywhere. And you even got to watch the church when it comes to truth because there are some people who are starting their own churches because they want to perpetuate their own truth. Jesus said, I am the way. Yeah. 
John 14, 6, all of you know, Jesus said, I'm the way. I've told you before, without a way, there is no going. I am the truth. Without the truth, there is no knowing. And I am the life. And without life, there is no living. Jesus said, you need to know about me. Learn about me. Learn about me. Take up your cross and follow me. Learn about me. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Church ought to be a place. We have made the church other than what God has sanctified it to be. This is a place for developing saints. What did I say? Developing saints. What did I say? Developing saints. Maturing the saints. And we have made the church a place where we do just about everything. Except the main thing. We have stopped making the main thing the main thing. The main thing is to win souls and to mature the saints. And the main thing is to tell people the truth. Tell people the truth. Thirdly, the church is the place where the glory of Christ is revealed. Ephesians 3 and 29, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Aren't you glad to know that the church exists? Because we share the witness of Christ. Look at what the church has done through all of these crises, through Ebola and with these people who are sick, not only in our community, but around the world. Look how the church has intervened to be the first on the forefront of these causes. Look at it with its mission mind. Look at it, ladies and gentlemen, at what the Lord is doing, feeding the poor uh, f and, and the hungry and changing lives. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness can't put it out. The church, fourth, is the appointed place where there is true biblical worship. Second, first Peter, 2, 9, and 10. Here it is. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have mercy. Now, that's not wrong with pri private worship. We need private worship. And it's a wonderful thing when you have your own time and your own intimacy with the Lord. You can't beat it. I mean, it's great when you and God rendezvous, when you and God get together. But I'm going to tell you, how much more? I mean, that piano is wonderful. Oh, I love that piano. Y'all just don't know. I love the piano, but that's all right. I love the organ. That's a wonderful instrument. I love it. I love that. I love these keyboards. I love to hear these drums these trumpets and all of these other instruments that these people are playing in a singular way. But boy, when they come together, when they are meshed together and when they are synchronized and when they are harmonic and when they are symphonic, then there is this crescendo. Look, I love to hear Talani. Keisha, Berlin, and all of these beautiful people. Man, they got it. J.J., I love J.J. I mean, he got it. He's singing on the radio. Push. Yeah, push. Push. I'm push. Is it push now? Push. <laughs> I mean, man, it's great. It's great to hear people around the world singing independently and individually. But man, when all of y'all, if, if something, something happens. Well, oh God, 
it's a wonderful thing that we are made to synchronize. And in synchronizing, it shows us a foretaste of what can you imagine when the billions of saints get together. This is Revelation 4 and 5. When the billion of saints get together in heaven and are united in one voice of glory and adoration and admiration. Hallelujah. I think we're all singing it right now. Come on, gentlemen. That's what we need to sing right now. How much time I got? I have five. No, I don't have five minutes. Give me something where everybody can sing. Yeah, I want everybody. I want all of you who don't, who hate singing to sing. Just get up and do nothing. Just get up and just act like that. Act mind. Do something. Act like you're singing. Stand on your feet, everybody. Stand. I know, I know you're mad and you're tough. You go, come on, stand. Stand with me. Stand with me. What we're singing, son? Hallelujah. Yeah. Take it in the wrong way. We have a wonderful choir. I mean, they bless our hearts. They, they thrill us. They it, turn us on. You know, they ignite something within us. But I'm going to tell you something. That choir don't sound like this. It, no, it can't touch all, all this. No. Not when the Spirit of the Lord is moving. I said when the Spirit of the Lord is moving. No, 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 no. And thank God for you. Let me tell you something. But when you give God the opportunity for you to come into worship and adoration and to do it unabashedly, and to do it without inhibition. Not only does the environment change, but your whole world changes. Come on, one more time, son. Everybody say.
You see, this is my final point, and don't sit down, but listen to me. This is my final point. This is what that 23rd to 25th verse of that Hebraic passage is. It says the reason why we're meeting together is that we are to become the cornonia. You know, we are the godly fellowship, but what, is that, what does that mean? That means that we have come together once a week. We do this. I look in your eye, but not only do I look in your eye, prayerfully, I look into your heart. You look into my eye and to my heart and to my spirit, man, because we need encouragement. We need, that's what the church is about. It's not about putting you down. Nobody has to tell you that you've fallen short, but somebody ought to tell you how you can get up. One more time, son. Since you have come, this is why worship, and this is why we should come together, and this is why we should fellowship to encourage one another. But always remember what Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name. I'll be in there. Did you hear what I said? Where two are three. There are a whole lot more than that in here. I said a whole lot more than that in here. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. One more time, son. Come on, let's give him glory and honor. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Lord.